My text will be Hebrews 3, 12 and 13, two verses. It's a text addressed to Christians. It says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. You know, when people talk about the problem of unbelief, they don't think it's a sin. They think it's a problem, but it's not a sin. And they'll say things like, well, I pray all the time for more faith, and nothing seems to happen. I don't want to have all the unbelief I've got, but, you know, I'm doing my best, and I'm reading the Bible, and I still have this unbelief problem, but they don't think it's a sin. The Bible calls it an evil heart of unbelief. It's evil to not believe God. And you have to look at it that way or you'll never get out of it. You have to look at it from God's viewpoint. He's telling us it's evil, it's wicked. Spurgeon said that unbelief was the bottom line of all sin. All other sins he thought came from that one sin of unbelief. First John 5, there's a verse that says, He that believes not God has made him a liar. It's a sin that calls God a liar. Remember that. Unbelief. It should have no part in a Christian's life, but unfortunately in our churches there are probably thousands of people that they sit there as if they're in an icebox or something. They don't think anything's going to happen, and they're never disappointed. You know. And uh, so, take heed. It sends men to hell. He that believes not shall be damned. He that believes not the sun shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The fearful and the unbelieving will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. It says over in Revelation, it sends people to hell, unbelief dogs. It makes God a liar. First John 5 tells that reference, uh, by the way, in First John. There are 7,487 promises in the Bible. I got them in a book, index, and everything else. That's right, almost 8,000 promises. And I say to myself, how can any Christian worry? What are you worrying about? Don't you know what these promises are? That they're in the Bible? They're meant for you? And then on top of that, there are 413 references to the phrase, Thus saith the Lord. You know. And there's almost, well, quite close to 4,000 statements, the Lord said, or God said, almost 4,000 times in the Bible. It's God speaking. And there's no room for unbelief. You know, when Abraham was told he's a hundred years old and his wife is not far behind, and he's told they're going to have a child of their own, how did he handle it? Well, Romans chapter 4 tells us this. He didn't stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And it says about his wife Sarah, that she conceived seed, when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. The promises don't do anything if you don't believe them. They only help when you believe them and apply them. It says over in Hebrews as well that the word preach did not profit some people because it was not mixed with faith and those that heard it. So the promises don't do anything if you don't believe them. Makes God a liar. Makes the promise of God empty. It prevents God from working. In Psalm 78, there's a verse that says, They turn back. They turn back. And uh, they limited God. You know, God is not limited to the faith of his people, but God has, during this gospel age, limited, not exclusively, but almost so, I think, He's limited his activity to the prayers of his people. 
They limited God. You limit God by what God can do in your life, in your family, in your church, by your wicked unbelief. It's going on all the time. It's very evil, I say, because it makes God a liar. What it says about Jesus in Nazareth, his hometown, that he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They were saying, what well, is Jesus? We know all about him. His dad was a carpenter, he's a carpenter. We know all about his family. Who does he think he is? So unbelief took over, and he couldn't do any mighty works there. He did in Capernaum and other places, but not in Nazareth, where he had been raised. And uh, so the Bible makes it very clear that even the Lord Jesus Christ was limited by unbelief. Now in Luke chapter 9, a wonderful thing happened, a strange thing in some ways. Jesus gave the twelve apostles power over all demons. In the same chapter, and it's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the same chapter, they tried to cast a demon out of a demon-possessed boy, and they couldn't do it. And the Pharisees were needing them. Christ wasn't around. He was up in the mountain with Peter, James, and John. So they were doing their best and nothing was happening. It was so embarrassing. Then Jesus came on the scene and he took care of the problem. And afterwards they said to Jesus, Why couldn't we? And he said, Because of your unbelief. Then he said, how be it, this kind, that is, this kind of demon, only goes out through fasting and prayer. But something else happened in the story that's very significant. The father of the child saw Jesus and said to him, I brought my son to your disciples, and they couldn't do it. If you can do anything, have mercy on us and help us. And he said, if you can believe. What he was saying was, it's not up to me. I've got the power. I have the love and compassion. I want to do it. I can do it. It's not up to me. Don't throw that if stuff at me, you know. If you can believe. All things are possible to him that believes. And the father of the child cried out with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief, that is, deal with my unbelief. I mean, faith and unbelief were there, both of them were there. But faith was in the ascendancy, and the child was healed. It's a beautiful story. If you can do anything, that's not the way to pray. You find a promise and stand on the promise and plead the promise back to God, and believe that God is listening. Let me give you an example. It was in Sault Ste. Marie, and I preached on faith, and this lady met with God that night. And a few days later she, took, she wanted to see me. They invited me for coffee. She and her husband and we had quite a talk there. And, and she told me their problem. She said, you know, I used to get migraine headaches once every six months. I still get them every month. Now I get them every week. And sometimes I get them three or four days in a week, she said. These terrible migraine headaches. And, and then she says, my husband, he can't eat anything but soup and milk. He's got such a bad stomach. And she said... And I've got a girl, a daughter, she's about 12, and she's never spoken a word outside the house. We've had it to counselors, and they said there's some block in there, we don't know what it is. She just doesn't talk outside the house. And so she said, do you think I can believe God for this problem? I said, absolutely. So she went and shared it with her pastor, and he talked her out of it. He said, lady, you know, I believe in a safe thing, but you know, you might pray these prayers and it doesn't work, and then you're going to be worse off than you were before. And he talked her out of it. Well, I left. I was back in Sioux City two years later, and they invited me to coffee again. And she didn't know what happened. They decided just, let's, let's believe God, you know. She pointed to her husband, she said, you know what? He can eat cactus and Bob Boyer now. And she said, I've only had one migraine headache since the night we prayed and committed to God. And that came because I started to doubt God. I'm not saying that migraine headaches are caused by unbelief, but that's what she said about herself. And she said, my daughter, what happened the next day after we prayed the prayer faith? She went to school. She was going to school. And she got up in the class, all in the house, and she repeated the, Lord, the Psalm 23 to the whole class. 
from talking now and ever since. No, God does those things even today. What are you saying in your heart? Are you praising the Lord or just you got a big question out there? Watch it. Our text is speaking to Christians, remember, take heed, brother, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Very important to know that. Well, it brings evil on men. There's many cases in the Bible. We won't go into that in detail at all, but many people in the Bible who failed. Israel wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. A distance from Mount Hope to Kadesh Barnea was 11 miles, and it took them 40 years to make it. Why? Unbelief. Simple, straight unbelief. They were looking at the giants in the land instead of looking at the giant God. That was the problem. And so they were forced to wander them for 40 years and went through all that horrible howling wilderness it's called, scorpions and all the rest of it, just because of the wicked unbelief. It's in the Bible, dear people, to warn you and me. We run into a lot of problems too as Christians if we allow unbelief to take over in our hearts. So we have to watch it. Take heed, brother, unless there be in any of you then an evil heart. Remember, it's evil. God hates it. It's a sin. You've got to call it that. And start believing God and standing in the promises. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith works by love. You know what Spurgeon said about that? He said, faith is the soul at rest in the love of God. Think it through. I want to talk about faith for a little bit. We all know we're saved by faith, right? But it's surprising over the years, people I've counseled with, one lady said to me, I have asked Jesus into my heart at least 50 times, and he never came in. So I said to her, and who's lying? You are Jesus. And she didn't like that approach, you know. Well, I'm not. Oh, Jesus is? What are you getting at, she said. I said, when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, did you thank him for being there? <laughs> she said, I can't do that. He wasn't there. I didn't feel he was there. I said, it's got nothing to do with feeling. You're supposed to believe. And she'd never seen this before. And so I said, now let's do it again. Ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and then thank him. Never mind how you feel. Thank him for being there. And she did. And then she said, oh, oh, that's different. And she had assurance. But how often we run across people like this. We had one case in Winnipeg during meetings in 1972, and that was revival time. And this gal came to my wife and me, and she said, um, I'd love to be a Christian. I'd love to have faith, but I have no faith at all, and I don't know how to manufacture it, and I don't know what to do. Well, I said, would you mind if my wife and I prayed that God will give you faith? The Bible says faith is a gift from God, you know. And she said, can you really do that? I said, sure. So the three of us now, my wife began to pray, and before she was through praying, the girl slapped her hands and cried, I've got it! I've got it! God just gave her faith. I can't explain that. Theologically, but it's God, you know. He faith is a gift from God, and He did that for her. And I don't doubt it in the slightest. So we're saved by faith. It's not how you feel. You know, sometimes people say, "You know, to be perfectly frank and honest, God's a thousand miles away." I said, "What God are you talking about? He fills the heavens and the earth, the one in the Bible. You're talking about some other God, aren't you? Because He fills the heavens and earth, no matter where you go." God's there. If you could fly at the speed of light for a million years and get out on some distant planet, he'd be there, you know. You can't go anywhere where God isn't. He is never, ever a foot away from you. In him we live and move and have our existence. In God. When you wake up to that, it has nothing to do with how you feel. It has to do with what he's told us and taught us in the Bible. He is everywhere, always, night and day. 
And sometimes people say, well, I think he's given up on me. What God are you talking about? The God of the Bible, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. What God are you talking about that forsook you, you think, you know? You just go down the line, people have all kinds of stupid notions, sinful notions about God. We need to get lined up, connected with the Word of God, what He's told us about Himself. He's a great God. Listen, the Bible says in Isaiah that He has counted all the stars. Do you know what they're telling us now, this Hubble telescope thing? They've been saying up until recently that there are 50 billion constellations, spiral nebula, like the Milky Way. And they just recently discovered, no, no, the figure's wrong. There are a hundred billion like that. And the Milky Way constellation, of which we are part, is so vast if you travel at the speed of light, 186 miles a second, isn't that about it? Some millions of miles an hour, it will take you 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way. This is the God we're dealing with. How do you think that God feels when you doubt Him, and you doubt His promises, and you doubt His Word, and you're making Him a liar? How the Word of God, how God must grieve that He looks so strangely at His promises and His Word. So we're saved not by feeling, we're saved by faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Don't forget the little postscript there. And thy house. Believe God, but don't let the devil have any of your kids. If he's got some of your kids, don't give up on them. Trust God to do it. Believe God for it. God will do that for you. You have to believe God. I had a daughter that strayed. She walked out of our life. We came home one day. She was gone. And she used my van to move all her stuff. We didn't know where she was. We found out. We contacted her. We asked her to come home for a talk. And she came away. Well, she defenseless when she walked to the door. I mean, just, whoop. And so we talked. said, honey, we want you to know that we love you. We saw you were gone, but if you found a better place, that's fine by us. And so we just loved her, and we prayed for her, and we contacted her, and so on, you know. And the years rolled by, and we didn't see anything happening. And I wasn't done cool with my wife. Who was, she, she had lived in New York and Montreal and Toronto, and now she's in Vancouver. No, she's back in Toronto now, but she was in Vancouver then. And we visited her. And she was glad to see us. We established a pretty good relationship, but she wasn't with God. And uh, walking from where she lived one day, there was a big Baptist church, you know. So I said to my daughter, Hey, honey, you ever gone to that Baptist church? Oh, she said, It's dead. I said, If you've never gone there, how do you know it's dead? She said, Dad, I've walked by there on Sunday. There isn't a single car parked at the curb in front of that church. She didn't know there was a big parking lot in behind. There was hundreds of cars there, you know. So I went there Sunday morning to check it out. Wow. About 800 people was packed in there. The bathroom was full. The dancers were full. The singing was full. The, the preaching was, wow, was firing great. So I told her, Honey, I said, You better check it out. There's a fire burning over there. And you know what happened? Two weeks later, she checked it out. And she finally said, Dad, he got through to me. He got through to me. And uh, there's more to the story than that. She's in Toronto now. We're getting emails from her all the time. And the last email she was saying how she's praying about a certain thing. I don't think she's connected with the church at this moment. It's, she had something happen in Vancouver. A very personal friend was knifed. And she lost something at that point. And so we're still praying for her and trusting God for it. But she loves the Lord, and she loves us. Anyway, don't give up on your kids. No matter what Satan's done, don't give up on them. And thy house. And thy house. Okay, so we're saved by faith. Then we're kept by faith. You can't keep yourself. The Bible says we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Faith is part of it. Just believe God. Don't worry about it. The devil tempts people. And some Remember a lady one time she said to me, I won't feel safe until the gates of heaven clang shut behind me. I said, that's a miserable way to live. 
There's something that that is in the gospel, you know. It doesn't say you don't, you don't feel safe till you get there, you know. And so you tremble and shake up. But you know, about 35 years later, she and her husband came to a better understanding, and they wrote me a letter and said, "We now know what you're talking about. We're saved by faith. We're in the hands of God forever." That was good to hear. We're kept by faith. You can't save yourself. You can't keep yourself out of it. The Bible says we stand by faith. It says we walk by faith. Second Corinthians 5. You know, that's one of the best texts in the whole Bible. We walk by faith. It has nothing to do with how you feel. It has to do with what God said and the guidance you're getting from God. We walk by faith. Now, George Mueller, Bristol, England, God raised him up by impositive to bring a blessing to the church forever. He had, he had 2,000 orphans, a staff of around 300. He had no organization backing him. He had no particular churches backing him. He got no help from the government whatever back in those days. He never once told anybody what the need was. And he had this saying, if God knows what the need is, who else needs to know? Hey, think it through. If God knows, who else needs to know? Nobody else needs to know. So he never, he never, no matter what the need, and he had strange things happen, you know. One time they had nothing for breakfast. And so uh, they prayed about this, had all the kids at the table, and they prayed for breakfast. And the guy was going by with a milk wagon, and something happened to one of the horses. He couldn't go any further, so he came in and asked if they could use some milk. So they had milk enough for breakfast, and then a guy came along with a bread wagon, and something happened to the bread wagon, and he brought all his bread, and he didn't want to go stale. I mean, things like this were happening all through his life. He had 85,000 recorded answers to prayer. And Charles Spurgeon used to try and spend at least one day a year with George Mueller. He said, he's got such a simple, childlike faith, it's so refreshing to be with him. He just believed God, you know. No matter what. He was coming to speak in Montreal, Canada one time, and his ship got become in the Gulf there, in the, uh, the St. Lawrence River, in a big fall. The captain was a Christian, and so Mueller said, um, I have an appointment Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock in a certain church in Montreal, and it uh, doesn't look like we're going to make it. He said, what's, what's with this fog thing? And the captain said, well, it could last for three or four days. No, it can't, you said. I have never been late for an appointment in all my life, and I'm not starting now. And the captain laughed. He said, you don't know this fog business. And he and Mueller said, you don't know this God business. So he said, let's pray. So Mueller prayed, and I read that for a short prayer. I just went like this, dear God, I'm sure it would please you to lift the fog. Thank you for doing it. Amen. So the captain began to pray, and he stopped, and he said, You don't need to pray. The fog's already gone. He said, And besides, you don't believe it's going to happen. So the captain rushes to the door, so, and the fog is gone, you know. And this was happening all through his life, you know. So we read these stories. There's a book on his life that's called Delighted in God. It's a, it's a, it's a recent book, and it's, it's powerful. You ought to get it and read it. When I was first converted, the only book I had was a book on the life of George Mueller, of Bristol, England. It was a tremendous blessing to me. I saw this faith thing right away at the beginning. I didn't learn it 10 or 15, 20 years down the road. It was a tremendous help and challenge to me. Okay. So we stand by faith, we're kept, we're saved by faith, we stand by faith, we walk by faith. It doesn't matter how you feel. What has God said? Stand on the promise. You know, when you read in the Bible, every time you come across a promise, put a big P in the margin. You'll finally have 7,487 if you read it right. That's what Dr. Herbert Lockyer found when he read it and wrote a book on it. Promises. Exceeding great and precious, Peter said. And they are that. You'll never, listen, you'll never run into a problem ever in your life anywhere at any time that isn't covered somewhere in the Bible. That's why you need to get to know it well. There's something there for you always, anytime. 
Then it goes on to say, the Bible speaks about your work of faith. Your work of faith. You work in faith for God. You're doing what you're doing. Trusting God is going to bless what you're doing. You're giving out trash. You're blessing. You're believing God. He's going to bless that. You're witnessing the people. You're preparing sermons. Whatever you're doing, you're believing. It's the work of, it's the work of faith. And it's a fight. Fight the good fight of faith, it says. It's a fight. The devil will be there trying to knock you down. You know what it says? Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to quench put out all the fiery darts of the wicked. You can't stop the devil from throwing these darts at you, but you can put them all out through faith. So you need it. Take the shield of faith. Remember, above all, with all the armor you have, that's the most important. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you shall be able, I say, to quench the pearl. You know, it's a fire. Satan throws fiery, fiery darts. You've got to take care of them. The devil climbs on. Remember one time when I was preaching way back years ago in the, in the, with the Shannon's Mission of Logging Camps, and, and I, I walked as much as 25, maybe 30 miles a day with a pack on my back with Bibles and New Testaments and, and tracts and stuff, you know. And you get to a camp, and if, there, if there's an empty bunk, you can be sure of one of two things. Either it's, it's cold or it's lousy. And so my wife and I made that a matter of pleasure. You know, I never brought a louse home in all this time. I was four and a half years in Bush camp and I brought a louse home once, you know. We prayed about that, see. And uh, I remember being in one camp, and in the morning the guys around me said, How did you sleep last night? Great, I said. And then they told me this bunk was lousy. And I didn't pick any lights up, you know. Just a little thing, a big God, you know. He can do anything. And sometimes, I remember one time I was riding, it was 40 below. And they had two roads, a go-down road and a go-back road. And you had to get on the right road. If you got on the wrong road, you'd meet tra traffic coming your way, and there was no way to turn out. And these roads were rutted than ice, and you couldn't turn out. Your wheels might turn, but you wouldn't get out. We got into that trouble one time. We'll go into that. Anyway, this day, I'm on top of a load of lumber. This truck is doing not more than 25 miles an hour, but remember, it's 40 below, so you know how cold it is then. I'm lying on top of this green frozen lumber. And there's a big couple of chains across this lumber holding it down. The only thing I had to hold on to keep from sliding off was the chain. But if the load slipped and your hand was under the chain, you'd lose your fingers. So I'm riding and the devil got on my back and said, You stupid fool. You could be, you, you could be, you could be, you could be, all these things, you know. I listened for a while and I said, Now wait a minute. I don't like what you're saying. Shut up. In Jesus' name, just shut up. And he quit. And so that's how you have to handle it. You know. Forget about it. Things go bad. One day, I'll tell you, just one other incident. I was in a camp, and I talked with some Christian guys from another camp. They knew were going to be coming out in the road, and I was going to walk 12 miles and meet them at this junction. They couldn't get the car started. It was 40 below or something. You couldn't get the car going. I didn't know this, so I started walking up their road. I started to freeze up, so I started walking back, because my back began to freeze up. So I got off, and I found some, uh, it was all green timber, but I did find some dry stuff, and I got a fire going, and waited around the fire. They didn't show up, and the fire went up, and I couldn't find any more dry, dry wood, and I was in a serious position. So I just said, hey, God, and I heard a car coming. And it was these guys, and they were driving furiously, because they knew I'd be in trouble, you know, because they knew what the day was like. But it, everything, it always worked out, you know, you just trust the Lord. And there's just one other thing I could mention here from those days also. I'm walking out of a bush camp. It was Saturday night. I walked 12 miles in. When I got there, they went and had a meeting because they had a big fight on the camp about wages and stuff, and there was a big argument. I said, we have no time for me. So I had to walk out 12 miles. So I'm walking along. It's very cold. You know, when it's very cold in the bush, the trees will snap. You'll hear them snap in the cold at nighttime, or in the daytime. I'm walking along. The trees are snapping occasionally. And all of a sudden, a bunch of wolves hollered behind me. You know, not more than maybe 50 yards behind. Oh, my hair stood straight up my head, you know. I must have jumped about 12 feet ahead in one jump. And then my mind began to play tricks on me because the trees were crying. Oh, they're coming from this side. Oh, they're coming from this side. I had nothing to defend myself. You see, the book says, the book says that they won't attack you 
as long as you're standing. But I wasn't positive they'd read the book. And so, you know. And this went on until I got, I got smartened up. And I stopped and said, hey, I talked to them. I said, Lord, you said the wild beasts of the forest are mine. These clunkers, they're yours. You take care of them. I had no more problems. And I started singing. And they kept hollering. After a while, they quit and they were gone. So no matter what the problem is, you won't run into that kind of a problem, I'm sure. But problems like that. Trust God. He allows trials to come to test our faith. We get stronger through trials, you know, not weaker. So you learn to trust God, and you can trust God for more. Mueller said, and I put it in Canadian dollars, he said there was a time when I had difficulty trusting God for five dollars. The time came when I could trust God for fifty thousand dollars with no problem at all. He got to know God, and he said faith is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets, the less you use it, the weaker it becomes. He's absolutely right. So don't think you can get through life without trials. You can try to spend a lot of time wasting time. They'll come anyhow. We must through much tribulation inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible says that. Look your mind up to it. Okay, so we stand by faith, we walk by faith, we run by faith. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Seeing we also are accomplished about surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every way. And the sin which thou so easily beset us, let us run with patience the race that set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He started it, he'll carry it on, he'll finish it. He'll be with you all your days. You're running a race by faith. Lay aside every way. And the sin which thou so easily beset us, dear people, I think, is the sin of unbelief. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. Unbelief and faith. Chapter 11, a great chapter on faith. Believe in God. And a great list of heroes of the faith. And by the way, you might be, you need to be reminded perhaps that Samson is listed among the heroes of faith. Ever think about that? Well, he was a kind of a wicked man, wasn't he? He judged Israel for 20 years and God raised him up to deal with the Philistines and did a pretty good job on that, you know. But there's two things about Samson that most people don't know. One is he was listed as a man of faith in Hebrews 11. What did he do by faith? He had this mighty power. He never had it all the time. He only had it when he believed God in him. He had about the Spirit coming on him. 3,000 men of Judas came to him and asked his permission to tie him up. So he could, he could be delivered to the Philistines because they, they were afraid of Philistines. So he allowed them to do that. Now normally he couldn't have done anything about the ropes. When the Philistines shouted, something happened and Samson, the Spirit of God came on him. I am positive in answer to his faith. And the ropes melted off his arms and he found the jawbone of an axe, wasn't it? Yeah. And slew a thousand men. He had to believe God for these things. The Spirit of God was not always on him. Why would it say the Spirit came on him if the Spirit was always on him? Faith. And that humility, he was an extremely humble person. He came alive with his bare hands. He never even told his father and his mother. You know, Spurgeon's comment on that was this. Samson killed a lion with his bare hands and never even told his father and his mother if a modern Christian should kill a mouse he'd have to publish it in the Gospel Gazette. And you know when he came back a second time on the same path he turned aside to look at the crops of the lion and bees had made a nest in it and he was hunting and he got this honey way down the path for his mom and dad to catch up and gave him the honey he never told him where he got it. Why? He didn't want them to find out what had happened. He was an extremely humble person. He failed in some areas. And at the end, he committed suicide. Let me die with the first, but let me tell you something. When he died, he killed more than he did while he lived. Philistines, enemies of God. All the top brass were there. Everybody was there. 3,000 in the roof, I don't know how many down below. And, he, and it was like he was on a cross because he was pushing the pillars out. It's a picture of Christ. He did more by dying than he ever did by living, you know. 
And you do the same soul lot. We'll do more by dying to self and then living to the glory of God than we can do by just living in the flesh in a carnal way. There's so much carnality in churches today that sometimes you can't be sure whether a church or what they are, you know. I like this guy Symbol. Some of you read some of his books, you know, and what's happening in in New York. And friends of mine went to check him out, so they went to New York to check out his prayer meeting, and they said it's all true. They got there at 5 o'clock. The went doors open at 5 o'clock. The prayer meeting is until 7. By the time 7 o'clock comes, there are hundreds and hundreds of people in there. Some of them praying for an hour and a half already, you know. And then finally at 7 o'clock, and the place is packed, maybe 1,600 people are there. And it may go on for two hours and maybe for three hours. And right now, his, his church seats 1,600. Right now, he has to have three services every Sunday. And the place is packed to the door for each one. I don't know how he does it. I sure pray when I would think of him for him. We have a book, I think, for two of him, his on the table. But he speaks, he challenged a bunch of preachers in the States, and he gives them a hard time about prayer. He says, you tell me you can only get 60 people out to your prayer meeting? What kind of a church do you have? Brother, he said, and then he wasn't bragging. He's not that kind of a person. Well, how come I can get 1,600? You, you can only get 60? You've got a bigger church, you've got more members than I've got? What, what's wrong? What kind of a church do you have? Well, people don't believe in prayer meetings anymore. Oh, really? come on. Let's get real. Don't believe in prayer meetings? Are they Christians, really? What are they? Don't believe in praying. You know, a dog's thing, they say, is to bark and eat. And a Christian's thing is to pray. Prayer is called the breathing of the soul. That's taken from Lamentation 356. It goes like this. Do not hide your ear at my breathing, at my cry. It's the breathing of the soul. If you don't breathe physically, you'll die. You don't have to think about it, because when you're sleeping, you're breathing, right? And prayer should be like that. We're praying without ceasing. We find ourselves talking to God all the time. Two of the days, we're awake. We wake in the middle of the night, start praying. That's just normal Christianity. Anyway, faith. We have access to God by faith, it says. We receive the righteousness of God by faith, Philippians chapter 3. We receive the Holy Spirit by faith in Galatians chapter 3. We work by faith. We already intimated that. You know there are 24 different things that happen to us Christians through faith. It's incredible. You study it out sometime. It's a great study. We have to learn how to believe God. And stop looking at the problem and allowing the devil to talk us out of the blessing of God. Carl God and I were down in Texas one time. We are in a large Baptist church and the preacher came one time, the head pastor, and he said, uh, Ever pray for the sick? I said, Yes, I don't have the gift of healing or anything, but I pray for the sick. Ever seen anybody heal? Yes, I said, We have. He said, i got a tough one for you. And here was a young man, 28 years of age, down with cancer. His wife was a nurse. She had him at home on a striker frame. He couldn't stand the weight of a blanket. We went to see him, and she told us, now, he can't, he can just whisper, he can hardly talk. He just had a pair of shorts on, and he broke purple blue lumps sticking out all over his body. I mean, if I had looked at his body, I would have never prayed, you know. But we had prayed about it, Howard, and we felt God wanted us to go. So we went and we prayed on Saturday and nothing happened. We finished on Sunday the crusade, we flew home on Monday, and later on I got a letter from the head pastor, Dr. Bass, and he said, the doctor said there isn't a cancer cell left in his body. Well, God does things like that. We had a gal when I was in trans school many years ago, 40 years back, and a gal from my church, she was quite ill, and her daughter asked if I'd come and pray for her mom, and I went in, her mother was dying of cancer too. And they'd amputated one leg, and the cancer was still traveling, and they had a real problem. And so I didn't really feel like praying. And I, you know what? It's not feeling. Forget your feelings. So I prayed. I spoke to her. She didn't give any response. And so she was moaning from the pain. And I just prayed that Jesus Christ would heal her. 
And I finished my prayer and walked out the door. If I had waited three minutes, she was sitting up in bed hollering for the nurses. She had been instantly healed. She told me after, she said, when you spoke to me, I heard every word you said. But she said, um, I couldn't respond. The pain, I thought it was dying. And she said, when you started praying, Jesus Christ walked in the door, came right over and put his hand on my body, and I thought he was taking me home to heaven. And she said, he touched me. I was healed. I don't have the gift of healing. I just believe God, you know. You have to pray about these things. The Bible says lay hands suddenly on no man. I don't go around laying hands on horses and camels and stuff, you know. I don't do that. Run, run. You know, people pray over their car. I've done that too and seen things start when it couldn't start, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, faith covers everything, but you don't want to be foolish in this either. So lay hands suddenly on no man. Ask God for guidance. He'll guide you. If he wants you to pray for this person, he'll show you that. And um, anyway, brethren, take heed lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Where are you at now? When you go to church, some of you are pastors, when you go to preach, do you believe God's going to bless what you're saying? And people, when you go to church, do you believe something's going to happen? God's going to speak? Do you really believe that? Or do you just sit there, hope he doesn't preach beyond 12 o'clock? That goes on all the time, right? When the Bible comes watching, I remember we took a team from Saskatoon to Toronto. I went to a seminary in Toronto. I had a team of five with me. I had them share, and I spoke, maybe 15 minutes. And we sat down and waited for something to happen. If God isn't in town, you're going to be disappointed. You know that meeting went on for 14 hours. God began to work. People began getting to a telephone, phoning their friends and their family to come on down. God was there. We had a marvelous uh, time there. A chaplain of the seminary, he came running down the aisle with a church in front of these Chinese people. If you want to be prayed for, you come and kneel here. And he did that. And it went on and on and on. This chaplain came. I'll never forget when he prayed. And he, his prayer was something like this. He said, Dear God, all these years I've sought and taught the academic, and today I want the spiritual. And God filled him with the spirit. The following day, he was walking across the campus. He told me this several days later. He was walking across the campus. He happened to pass a male student from the seminary, and all he said to the student was, Good morning. The student said, I heard his testimony. I saw Jesus in the chaplain's face. And I ran back to my room and I prayed for two hours and I had a meeting with God. In times of revival, things like this become quite common. But we have to remember it's Jesus Christ who is at work. And don't get fanatical about it and don't think it has to happen. Don't try and man manipulate a meeting and make it happen when God isn't doing anything. There are times like that. We have a meaning that nothing happens. It doesn't mean nothing happened. It means you can't see what happened. Because like Job said, God works in the right hand. I can't see God works in the left hand. I don't see. But he said this. But he knows the way that I take. So that's enough to know God knows what I'm doing. I maybe don't know. We had one little window and she hated it. She couldn't see the sun in the daytime, you know. She hated the place she lived. She hated everything. She hated the church. She hated, and she just poured out herself. But you know what? She got victory. Because she died before God. We got her into that way. And she was praying, just talking about it. We said, now tell God about it. Ask God to forgive you for your attitude. And thank God that you have a place to stay and a place for your husband to work. And she did. She got total victory in that area. It was just beautiful to see. And so, watch it. Brethren, unbelief. How did you come to this meeting tonight? Did you come believing that God will speak to you? I hope you didn't come believing that Ben McClough is going to say something helpful. That might not happen, you know. But if you pray for God to say something, He'll say something, no matter how stupid the preacher is. Do you know how Spurgeon got saved? He was, um, I think it was 16, he was 15 years of age, He's walking to church on a Sunday morning, but a blizzard developed in London, and he saw he wasn't going to make to the church, so he stopped in a little Methodist chapel. There were 17 people sitting there, and the preacher never showed up. So one of the elders took over, he didn't know anything. So he stood at the front, hollering, Look to Jesus! Look to Jesus! Look to Jesus! Then he saw Spurgeon, he said, Young man, you sure look miserable. Look to Jesus! And Spurgeon said, I could have looked my eyes away. He saw the whole thing. 
He saw the whole thing. He got saved right to his side. He never could remember the name of the church, and uh, none of the biographers apparently know exactly where it was situated, but who cares about that? You'd think a man with the kind of intellect he had, you know, he could read three or four books, 400 pages each in an hour, and then quote whole pages of the page 64, 125. They tested him out. He was never wrong. He had a marvelous intellect. You'd think you'd have to get somebody with about 15 degrees after his name to preach a sermon that would read Spurgeon. That's not what's needed. And I'll give you another example like that. It was in Minneapolis, and we were at a preacher's conference years ago, and it happened this way. This pastor, there was two preachers, they both had big church in Minneapolis, and one always gave altar calls, the other never gave altar calls, and at least giving, telling his wife they were doing what they were doing. Well, the guy that gave altar calls said, I do it because it gets results. And the other guy said, I don't do it because I don't need it, I get results without altar calls. And they were good friends, you know. We had a good time there. And the guy who uh, never gave all the calls, he told us a story. I never forgot. You know, it helped me a lot. A banker, a very wealthy banker, began attending his church. So he told us, guys, don't bug this guy. He's very, you know, very self-conscious. Watch it. Don't, don't say anything to him. Just greet him, shake his hand. Don't say anything about God. He, he, he's coming. So he kept coming for about six months. Finally, the preacher prepared a sermon just for the banker. He said, I preached that sermon. I could see the guy moving forward on his chair. I was really getting through to him. And then the devil moved in, he thought. A kid in this congregation, 10 years of age, totally without any brain, went over to this wealthy banker and said something in his ear. And the guy shook his head. And the kid said something else. And the banker got up, totally angry, and stormed out of the meeting. You know. And he said, I thought, God, aren't you in control? Why did you let that happen? He really did have got a hard time after him. Saying, Why did you let that happen? The Lord never said anything. Stick around. So, that night, two in the morning, his doorbell rings. He goes to the door. The banker said, Pastor, i got to get saved. i got to get saved. So he went into Christ. Then he said, uh, What part of my sermon was it that reached you? Your sermon? I don't remember anything he said. It was that kid. Well, what did he say? He said, Do you want to go to heaven? I said, No. He said, Then go to hell. <laughs> that was it. You know. So, that's why, you know, people, we have to believe God, not the preacher. We're weak and not, we don't know much, we do our best, but you've got to ask God to speak, and God can use anybody then. And we have to be prepared for that. Do you pray for your pastor every day? I hope you do. Hold him up before God. Ask God to bless him. You know, Robert Chapman became a world famous evangelist. You know how he started out? He passed a little Presbyterian church, and one day the men had a meeting and said, You know, Pastor, you can't preach with a hill of beans. That's what they told him. But they said, we're going to pray for you. We're going to make a preacher out of you. And they did. He became such a great preacher, they lost him. And he became a world-famous evangelist. They prayed him into that. See, you can do that for your preacher. You don't want to lose your preacher. It's not the way to pray if you're trying to lose your preacher. But anyway, you know what I'm saying, I hope. Okay, so. Brethren, take heed. Christ said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in the whole of Israel. He was a Gentile, exercising faith. The Israelites weren't doing that. That's why Christ said, the kingdom of God is going to be taken from you and given to a people that will bring forth the fruits of all. If they heard it, they said, God forbid it happened anyway. But it was because of their unbelief, they looked at unbelief. You know, they're wandering still. People say, well, they're back in Israel. Four million on, there's 12 million still scattered around the world. There's 300,000 in Canada, there's several million in the United States of America. They're still wandering because they turned their backs on God and they forgot God. And there's only 8% of them today that are Orthodox that believe there's going to be a Messiah coming. The vast majority are agnostics or atheists, and 20% of them are communists, if you can believe that. That's the way it is. And they're standing rebuke. I mean, they, they're telling us what unbelief does. And we need to listen to that. 
and get on the victory wagon. The Bible says we are more than conquerors to him who loves us. We're more than conquerors. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Make up your mind to the glory of God and by the grace of God that you're going to become a spirit-filled, humble Christian that will believe God until the day you die. You can be that. You can do that. God will work with you in that if you ask Him to help you be that kind of person. But you've got to make time for God. You can't give God five minutes a day. You know what I did after I got to Saskatoon in 1962? We had a lot of 175 people, maybe 200 on Sunday morning. And one Sunday morning I gave them some little things to fill in. Questions like, uh, how much time a day do you spend in prayer? How much time a day do you spend in Bible study? Have you ever won a soul to Christ? Do you try and win people to Christ? Do you tie your income? Uh, questions like this, I could hardly wait to get those things back. When I got them back, I wish I'd never done it. I mean, I just sit there, sat there and cried. Uh, what are they doing? Many of them were Bible school graduates, or maybe five minutes a day Bible study. One guy put down 30 minutes in his conscience and smelled them, so he stroked it up and put a big goose egg there. He wasn't doing anything, Bible study or prayer. Then I saw the need for revival. They're nice evangelical people, and as I said before, they believed in evangelism and didn't do it. They believed in missions and never supported it. And that's what the, the way it's like in our churches today. We believe in a half-hearted sort of way. We don't believe with all our heart that God's going to do it. You know, Dr. Virgil Brock, he was the song leader, 85 years of age, when, when God broke in the crusade in 1971. His voice was cracked. He was off-key sometimes. Who cared? He was so full of God. And I said to him one day, Dr. Brock, there's an older man than you, 96 years of age, living across the lane from my church. Would you go with me and try and win him? Sure, let's go, he said. So we went, and I'll never forget it. This guy sat here, and Brock sat here, and I sat and listened. And Dr. Brock explained the gospel. Then he got up and stood in front of this man and put his hands and said, Now, sir, you have heard the message of Jesus Christ. You know now what the gospel is. Will you stand to your feet and take my hand and say by that, I am receiving Christ as my Savior. And the man looked at him and said, Sir, I will do that, and got to his feet and took his hand. That was Virgil Brock, you know. He loved the Lord with all his heart. And uh, I'm not sure one thing that happened in his life. He was a man of faith. His wife had died. He was on the circuit. He decided he'd stay single the rest of his life, unless get God indicated otherwise. He was in a church somewhere, uh, singing and all this kind of thing. He went back to his hotel that night and God said, Virgil, I want you to marry the pianist. And I said, you aren't going to believe that. You know, when he was telling us about it. But he said, that's exactly what happened. He said, I didn't know her name. I didn't know she, she, she must have been single. God wouldn't have said this. But he said, you know, I didn't even like the looks. He said, I struggled all night. My pillow was wet with tears. But when the sun came up in the morning, I said, God, if that's what you want, that's okay by me. You know what he did? He phoned the pastor to get her phone number. And he phoned her about 8 o'clock in the morning or whatever. And he said, the virtual doctor, I won't come see you. She said, well, 10 30, I'll be over in 10 minutes, he said. And she heard a gasp on the other end of the phone. So when he got there, she had her hair in curls and was wearing a house coat, you know. And she was there. And so she said, well, what... Uh, she said, did you want to come in or what's on your mind? And he said, well, the old time we're getting out of town, we should talk about the date. <laughs> and so she thought it was, he was a nut, you know. So, but he explained, no, I'm serious, I'm very serious. And she said, I have to pray about it. And he said, listen, sister, pray all you will. I know what the answer is going to be. So he gave her his forwarding address, and two weeks later he got a letter from this girl, and all it said was, yes. Yeah. But she was a little stubborn, you know. She'd never tell me that she loved him. So um, she showed it in her way, but she'd never say it. So he composed a song, which he sang at the wedding. And she didn't know about this, and so home the road he had just played the piano, and he sang this song. It was about a woman who would never say, I love you. And each verse ended the same way with the words, and she would never say, I love you. So he sang the last verse and just stood there and waited. 
And everybody waited. They all knew what was going on, you know, and nothing happened. And she kept scuffing her feet and looking down and finally she said, Georgia Black, I love you. The place exploded, you know. And then he found out one of the reasons why God gave him this woman. God was giving him new songs all the time, and God gave her the music. He didn't give him the music, God gave her the music. You know, he wrote, they wrote 150 songs, sing and smile and pull the clouds away, beyond the sunset, that's one of his songs, you know. But as a man of faith, he loved God with all his soul, and just walked with God. 85 years of age, so what? I'm just you know, quite a year behind, three months behind that. So what I'm trying to do what I can do as well. Now, I feel, I feel, let me tell you something. I feel like a mosquito with a broken wing. Even a mosquito with a broken wing can do a little buzzing. And I've been doing a little buzzing for God for 61 years now. I mean, that's the way it is. That's the way I, I really feel, you know. You know, God's really hard up because he can't find many people who walk by faith. When I first went preaching, little church, 25 people, they said they'd pay me $30 a month if they could afford it, and sometimes they couldn't. I could hardly wait to get there. After six months, I found a girl as crazy as I was, and then we had two of us had to live on $30 a month, you know. And we had a wonderful time just believing God. You run out, so what? God doesn't run out. You tell God, and right away something happens. Somebody drops off a couple of hams, somebody brings a sack of turnips, like in an apple, they'll help you, you know, and potatoes and stuff, you know. I wish I kept, but you know, we never, and we started tithing right away. Tithing off it, right off the top. And you know what? We were there about eight months, and God sent a revival, and 75 people were converted. And numbers of those people went to a mission field. Some to South America. As a matter of fact, a guy named Sam Hawes went to South America. He was converted in those meetings. And um, now his sons, two of his sons, are missionaries in Argentina. Because this happened over 60 years ago, you see. Anyway, listen. Oh, what else can I say? Trust God. Love Him. Trust Him. He'll never do anything wrong. He may do some things that you don't like. There's always a silver part to the cloud, you know. You may not see it now, but down the road you will. He's a great God. He's a gracious God. I've worked in His presence too, you know, over my own sins and failures. There are other things in the churches or whatever, you know. And God always listens and He wipes our tears away. The Bible says He puts our tears in his bottle, and spoken called tears, liquid prayers. You become in other words, you just cry. And God understands. He's a gentle, loving father. And please remember that faith is the soul at rest in the love of God. You can walk with God on your days once you understand that. You're at rest in the love of God. He is love. Give us these almost 8,000 promises and he's just saying my child believe me trust me trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your own understanding that's the last thing I have to say as far as the message is concerned why don't we pray And while we're in the attitude of prayer with nobody looking around, we ask a question or two. How many of you can honestly say, now don't respond to this to make me feel good, but how many of you can honestly say you have been helped through this conference? Would you raise your hand? Thank God, yes, God bless you. There may be some of you who are here for the first time, we don't expect you to raise your hand, now ask another question. Perhaps you realize you really need a personal revival or awakening of some kind. You're not really where you ought to be. And you'd like to do something about it. Would you raise your hand? Yes, yes, I see those hands, yes. Are there others? Thank you. Father, thank you for those who have been helped Thank you for those who need further help. And we ask you, dear God, to guide us in that in a very clear way. And bless the sessions tomorrow 
when you only end with this dear God, but we're not nearing the end of what you're doing in our hearts and lives. Thank you so much, Father, for giving us these um, wonderful texts that help us, dear God, to establish us. So we're trying to be like Abraham, who didn't start with the promise of God for unbelief, like his wife who believed she trusted you, dear God, and so she was blessed. So we will be blessed as well. Thanks again, Lord, for this evening. In Christ's name, amen.